Hello everyone! We noticed that a large number of you guys watch our videos without subscribing, so what's stopping you? Click here to stay updated with our latest nerdy content. And back to the video. Assalamu alaikum everyone, welcome back to another ATP video. Today we'll be talking about Listeria monocytogenes. It will be a short and concise video and we hope you find it beneficial. Listeria monocytogenes is a gram-positive, rod-shaped bacteria that is responsible for causing the infection listeriosis. The disease can affect anyone in the population. However, it's more common in individuals with weak cellular immunity, like pregnant women, infants, and elderly. Although the number of cases involving listeria has decreased in recent years, and it's not the most common foodborne illness, it's still quite important to know about the bacterium as it's linked to the highest mortality rate. Approximately 1,600 people get listeriosis each year, with approximately 260 people dying from the disease. This was just a brief introduction about listeria. Now let's move on and talk about its important features. Listeria monocytogenes belongs to the class of bacilli and there are currently 10 species that belongs to Listeria. However, only Listeria monocytogenes is associated with human illness. The bacterium is gram-positive, non-spore-forming, facultatively anaerobic, and rod-shaped. It's catalase-positive and oxidase-negative, and it expresses beta-hemolysin, which causes destruction of RBCs on blood agar. Moreover, it exhibits a characteristic tumbling motility when viewed with light microscopy. Listeria is acquired by induction of unpasteurized dairy products and called deli meats. So, it's a primarily a foodborne disease. Interestingly, listeria grows very well at cold temperatures, so storage of contaminated food in the refrigerator can increase the risk of infection. And this paradoxical growth in the cold is called cold enhancement. As we've just mentioned, the bacterium grows intracellularly, and it can move by means of actin rockets which are filaments of actin that polymerize and propel the bacteria both intracellularly and across the membranes of different cells. All of these special features allow the bacteria to escape the host hemoral immunity, or in other words, the antibody defense mechanism. Now let's move on and talk about the unique virulence factors of listeria. So there are primarily four important virulence factors that enable the bacteria to become pathogenic. The first one is called internalin, which is a bacterial surface protein that facilitates its attachment to host cells. The second and third are listerolysin O and phosphatidylinositol, specific phospholipase C. Both help the bacteria to escape from the phagosome into the cytoplasm, thereby escaping destruction. And finally, actin polymerization, which allows the bacteria to move within and between cells as we've previously explained. Let's move on and talk about the transmission of listeria. This mainly occurs by one of two ways, either via fecal-oral route through ingestion of contaminated food such as unpasteurized milk or from the mother to her fetus transplacentally or by vaginal transmission during birth. Listeria has very important implication in clinical practice. In fact, throughout the history, several foodborne illness outbreaks have been associated with listeria. It can cause wide variety of symptoms ranging from self-limiting symptoms of gastroenteritis, similar to other foodborne germs, and up to more drastic clinical presentations that include, yet not limited to, sepsis, meningitis, granulomatosis infantiseptica, and even spontaneous abortion. As we've just mentioned, listeriosis can cause a variety of symptoms depending on the person and the part of the body affected. For example, infection in immunocompetent people can cause gastroenteritis with symptoms of watery diarrhea, fever, abdominal cramps, and so on. In pregnancy, however, infection can cause abortion, premature delivery, and newborns affected at the time of delivery as well as immunocompromised individuals can develop meningitis, which usually presents with fever, neck stiffness, headache, altered mental status, and other classic signs of meningitis. The patient may also demonstrate a positive Brzezinski or Kernick sign on physical exam. We have discussed many things about listeria today. The question now is, how can we diagnose it? Okay, so this is usually done with bacterial culture that grows listeria from a body tissue or fluid such as blood, spinal fluid, or the placenta. The appearance of colonies with a narrow zone of beta hemolysis on blood agar suggests the presence of listeria, and the isolation of listeria is confirmed by the presence of motile organisms 
which differentiate them from the other non-motile bacteria. Let's discuss the treatment of listeria. While well, usually ampicillin is the antibiotic of choice, an alternative treatment is termthoprim sulfamethixazole if the patient has penicillin allergy. However, keep in mind that the treatment mainly depends on the clinical presentation and it's not unified among all patients. For example, listeria gastroenteritis is usually self-limiting and does not require treatment. On the other hand, treatment of invasive disease such as meningitis and sepsis consists of combination therapy. It is much better to never have infection at all, so there are steps we can do to prevent infection. We've discussed earlier in this video the routes of transmission, which were either the fecal-oral way or during pregnancy and delivery. So if we can control these two ways of transmission, a huge number of people can be protected. Starting with simple measures such as proper hand washing techniques and limiting the exposure of pregnant women and immunosuppressed patients to potential sources such as unpasteurized milk can aid significantly in prevention of the disease. Until now, there still isn't any available immunization against listeria. Hopefully, further research can aid in solving this problem. We've reached the end of our video, and now let us sum up the points that we've discussed today about listeria. We've said they are gram-positive, beta hemolytic facultative intracellular rods that exhibit a characteristic tumbling motility. They possess a number of virulence factors that include, yet not limited to, internalins, listerolysin O, and phosphatidylinositol, specific phospholipase C, and actin polymerization. They're transmitted either via fecal overroot or during pregnancy and delivery. The diagnosis is mainly via gram staining and culturing, and ampicillin is usually the antibiotic of choice. However, treatment is tailored according to each case. And finally, there isn't available immunization, but proper hand washing and avoidance of food sources that might lead to developing listeriosis can significantly prevent the disease. And that's it for listeria. We hope you found it beneficial. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to receive our latest videos. And as always, thanks for watching.